Hi, I'm Dan Murphy from CNBC International, and welcome to this episode of 10th Talks, the discussion series hosted by NYU Abu Dhabi to reflect on the milestones achieved in the university's first decade here in the UAE. In this episode, I'm speaking with His Excellency Omar Al Alama, the UAE's Minister of State for Artificial Intelligence, Digital Economy, and Remote Work Applications. Your Excellency, thank you so much for joining us today. The pleasure is all mine, Dan. Thank you for having me. Your Excellency, most people know by now that you were the first minister in the world dedicated to artificial intelligence. Of course, the UAE was among the first nations globally to draft a smart strategy to become a global hub for AI. So take us back. Why has the UAE chosen to prioritize AI? Thank you, Dad, for this question. And, um, w- you know, if we look at the past couple of centuries, we see that there are certain trends that shape the future of the economy, the future of the society, and, um, you know, shape the world as we know it. We've seen that with the locomotive. We've seen that with telecommunications. We've seen that with the Internet. And the new wave, uh, which everyone knows is coming, is artificial intelligence. We see heads of state talking about the importance of artificial intelligence uh, with regards to shaping the future of their countries. We're seeing the top companies in the world being AI companies. So we uh, in the UAE, through the visionary leadership of scientists, Sheikh Khalifa bin Zayed al-Nahyan, the scientist Sheikh Hamad Barashta Maktoum, and Sheikh Hamad bin Zayed al-Nahyan, um, the leadership saw that we do not want to wait until this technology disrupts the way that our government should work. We do not want to wait until you know, we we become laggards and followers. We want to be at the forefront. We want to invest today. We want to build the human capital today. We want to enable our government, our private sector, and also attract the best and the brightest. Because um, the the faster you move in this field, the more the gap is going to be. And um, one important aspect that the Highness has outlined within the the strategy and also within uh, the, the direction that they gave me is we need to also try to upskill people in the region. We need to help everyone around us because you can't be living in the best or the most beautiful house in a slum or a ghetto. You need to make sure that everyone is as developed as you are so that you can benefit. Um, And that was one of the the reasons why we've invested in training a million people across the Arab world on coding, for example. So we have a program called the One Million Arab Coders Program. We have AI bridges that we've signed with countries, nine countries so far, that helps us share best practices with other governments, lets us show them our strategies and, you know, um, uh, try to understand with them what can be done on this front. Because what COVID has proven to all of us is, first and foremost, the digital is currently uh, at par with the physical. Uh, You know, we are today as much digital citizens as we are physical citizens. Second is the digital landscape does not know any boundary. The same way that COVID crossed all the physical and geographical boundaries and you know went into every single country we know that anything that is developed especially in the ai front can cross borders and can go everywhere so we need to work together with everyone to ensure that it's mutually beneficial for all countries Hmm. and that leads me well into my next point because i think we do hear a lot about the promise of ai but we rarely hear about its real world benefits or some of its real world applications it seems like AI is still a world away from our everyday. Is that a fair statement? I don't think so. It depends on the field and the sector. Uh, Certain sectors, you know, AI is here to stay and we can't live without AI. So if you look at search, for example, any question that we have, we don't consult another human being. You don't ask me about, I don't know, the, the, the trajectory of the Roman Empire from you know, the, the first century uh, BCE to, to whatever, you actually go to Google. Even if you had a historian in the room, you validate what he's saying by going to Google. So, you know, the, the, the oracle that answers all questions today is an artificial intelligence algorithm. If you think about entertainment, who do you go to? You don't actually switch on the TV anymore. You open Netflix, you go to YouTube. There are certain AI-enabled platforms that today actually allow us to consume the best kinds of content. Uh, just um, a, a few days back, I actually went and opened the first uh, grab-and-go store in the Middle East um, that had not a single human being. So you go there, you know, you, you scan a barcode on your phone, you can pick up any product, and you can leave without interacting with a single human being, without taking a, a single penny out of your pocket. And that's all enabled by AI. AI tracks you entering the store. AI knows exactly what you picked up. 
And then AI deducts that amount from your, your bank account. So in general, I think we're at the beginning uh, of the advent of AI. You know, we're seeing some applications. It's going to become more mainstream across different sectors. But I don't think the, the, the potential of deployment and the potential of development is going to be universal across all sectors. Some sectors are going to be already much faster. Others are going to take more time. I also think it's fair to say that uh, some countries are going to be leading this and others are going to be taking time as well. And I think it's interesting because uh, this also comes as the UAE is rolling out its Project of the 50 initiative. And uh, as you said during that event, the digital economy is going to be a major element of this. So give us some insight into the role that AI is going to play in driving the next phase of the UAE's economic development. This is something that you think about every day, I'm sure. Absolutely. 50 years ago, if we explained to the world what we're trying to achieve, it would, have been see, it would have been seen as impossible. Being in the Middle East, talking about being a global country, having international platforms that are you know, world-leading in, in, in some sectors, uh, talking about being the Silicon Valley of the Middle East, these things were, see, were you know, seen as uh, unreasonable visions or impossible visions that a country would have. Um, through 50 short years, the UAE has gone from having visions of the future to actually being a miracle uh, of growth that people are using as a benchmark. The next 50 years are going to be different because you, it, it's much easier to follow. You can actually see a target and, and follow it. The next 50 years is about being uh, at the forefront, uh, chartering uncharted territory. And that would require uh, using technologies that will help us consume data better, take better decisions, uh, helps us as well provide better services. And I think artificial intelligence is going to be a cornerstone of the next 50 years. What is going to drive all of that is not going to be the machines. It's not going to be the software. It's actually going to be the humans. So universities like NYUAD, the, the different uh, educational institutions that we have, the, the world cutting edge educational institutions, are going to graduate individuals that are going to be key for us to actually maintain our leadership and, and become the best country in the world. Without human capital, no country can achieve dominance in the, with regards to the economy or society or any sector. Absolutely. And it's very clear that this is really important for the UAE, right? Not just developing institutions like NYU Abu Dhabi, but also developing out the economy and in particular the non-oil economy, which has really been a pre key priority for the government. So, how important a role do you think organizations like Start AD, which is the accelerated program based out of NYU AD, are going to have in uh, helping to develop the businesses of the future and the businesses that are going to propel the UAE and its economy into the future? So, so let's look at, um, let's go back in history to understand what's going to happen in the future. Historically, those who started the biggest and most successful companies in the UAE, if we looked at the 40s, 50s, and 60s, for example, and 70s, were not Harvard graduated individuals or individuals that had the best education. It was individuals who were curious, who were risk takers, who were willing to risk everything to succeed. There were those who didn't, who also had all these attributes, but didn't succeed. But in general, I think if you have a good education, and that education you know, platform and the education basis that you have is also enabled with a very curious mindset and a very driven personality that has a risk-taking appetite, then that is a great equation for success on a global scale. I think, uh, how do you give people the ability to test their curiosity, to test actually you know, starting something up? Providing a, a sort of either space or an incubator or or a physical, let's say, the, uh, um, you know, space that allows people to just test it out. You won't succeed from the first time. You know, many, many entrepreneurs fail the first, second, or third time. But th the one time that you succeed, it's actually worth you know, more than the 10 times that you fail. So I think every single university needs to look at it this way. Uh, education is very, very important. It's critical. But there are other elements in the university that are as important. The social element of interacting with people, you know, finding a business partner, finding someone that can actually come in and stress test your product. The professors that are there, the incredible sets of expertise that are available for free right in front of your eyes, you know. And the more universities invest in creating programs like Startup AD, 
the more we are going to have success stories. And you don't need many. If you have one Facebook-like uh, platform coming out of Startup AD, it justifies every cost that you've ever invested because it will become a country uh, in terms of how much revenue generates. Facebook generates more than many countries in terms of revenues. So uh, I think that this is an investment that is worthwhile. Uh, the students deserve it. And hopefully we're going to see the fruits of that in the coming years. Hmm. So I wanted to um, expand on this a little bit further and perhaps tap into your remote work remit here. Do you think that the future of work and the future of study is ultimately going to be location-based? Because remote work really seems like something that the UAE wants to tap into with these new visa programs being rolled out here. But I know this has really emerged as a serious flashpoint on Wall Street and in the business community globally about what to do with staff and in the academic community, what to do with students in this COVID era. Do you think the future of work is going to be location-based, the future of study location-based? So, uh, again, it depends on what your work entails. Uh, certain jobs you can completely do remotely today, and it's already happening. And it used to happen even before you know, the pandemic. The pandemic just accelerated the adoption of uh, remote work platforms. Other jobs, like, for example, if you are expected to be a construction worker, it's very difficult for you to do construction work remotely today, right? Maybe in a short period of time, there'll be robots or, or certain technologies that will allow us to do that. Um, and, you know, you will have a... a digital, let's say, joystick that you, that you use to build, or maybe you completely replace these individuals. But uh, in general, uh, I don't think it's a blanket approach by saying all jobs are going to be remote or not going to be remote. The second thing on education, uh, to be absolutely honest and frank, a lot of really smart individuals, they get educated on YouTube, on Coursera, on Khan Academy, on many of these platforms. What you can't do as well um, on these platforms is the socialization part improving your communication skills, uh, building your network, um, you know, uh, being able to orate, being able to work in a group. It's very difficult to do that remotely. The value in universities moving forward is going to be a lot more on that aspect. The more curated the crowd in the university and the level of the crowd, the better. And that's why people like to go to Harvard because there's a high likelihood that the, that the people around you are going to be very successful people. And, and this is uh, absolutely true as well for NYU AD and, and many of the institutions that are in the UAE. It's about the, the crowd that you surround yourself with. And there's another thing as well. If you think about what happens when, when there is both peer pressure and peer support, having people around you that show you that this is not very difficult to learn or this class is engaging, allows you to do better. Doing it virtually sometimes does not give you that ability. You, you know, you, you, you tend to... Uh, discount your potential or your or capabilities and, and then not continue uh, that educational paradigm. So uh, what, I'm, what I'm really inclined, uh, inclined towards saying is remote work and remote education is definitely something that's here to stay. Is it here to stay for a all age groups? No. Is it here to stay for all jobs? No. Is it here to stay for, you know, in a way that replaces universities? Yes, but not every university. I think we're going to see a big portion of universities, so probably 20 or 30 percent of conventional, nothing really special universities close down because people will be able to access this content online or maybe even move completely online. But the, the prime universities that have the best um, uh, students and have you know, the best teachers, there is value in being surrounded by these individuals. Hmm. So ultimately, the benefits of collaboration outweigh the convenience of being able to work or study remotely, right? Absolutely. And there's one other element here. I think what remote work brings is convenience. So imagine if you, for example, if you as Dan need to travel for an emergency with your family. Today, in the world that we live in, you can actually go and travel with your family and you can still attend your courses online. And that is something that shouldn't change. The, the convenience aspect of being able to study from wherever if you need to, but also have the ability to go to a class if you want to, is a trend that should never die out. I think that that's something that's great. Even work, by the way, if you can work remotely, give people more days off, uh, make people feel happy that they're going to work, let them work from wherever they're the most productive, but put the right mechanisms to ensure that they're actually giving you 100% and you're, you're getting the right output. So just to expand on this a little bit further, I know the UAE has also been investing quite significantly into technology and into infrastructure 
like 4G, for example, and 5G into the future. Talk us, uh, talk to us a little bit about the UAE strategy for the fourth industrial revolution and some of the applications that we're likely to see coming out of that. Where do you see opportunities for NYU Abu Dhabi's students and, and uh, faculty to contribute when it comes to the investment that we're seeing in the development of the fourth industrial revolution? So artificial intelligence, um, you know, the digital economy is, is based on first, fourth industrial revolution technologies, right? And these technologies today, some of them are at the forefront, some of them are emerging. So, for example, if we look at blockchain, it's emerging and it's cu currently actually going through the limelight. There are other technologies like biotech and nanotech and others that are still in the periphery. Um, the fourth industrial rev revolution will bring a lot of opportunities for people to pioneer uh, new solutions, new businesses, new even research uh, capabilities that are not being you know, focused on as much today. 3D printing, for example, is something that we've been hearing about for years. 3D printing is going to revolutionize the, the building revolution or, or the building industry globally. You'll be able to construct buildings in 24 hours. We've heard that promise for at least five years now, but we still cannot you know, construct a building in 24 hours conveniently, right? Uh, advanced materials, there's a lot to do with graphene and you know, the promise it holds. So uh, what universities have today as a capability is to go and experiment with these uh, technologies and these emerging technologies, but not just experiment for the sake of pure science. Pure science is very important. Think about how can you commercialize it? So as a student, what can I do to commercialize a pure science play and create something out of it? All of the success that we've seen in the beginning of the 20th century across the US and Europe was people taking pure science I'm thinking about real-world practical applications for it. And then creating the supply chains, creating you know, the, the output that drives that. We have a huge opportunity today. And the Fourth Industrial Revolution Authority capitalizes on the potential of the youth here, the potential of the 190 nationalities that live and thrive on the UAE. So we're able to attract the best people. Let's use that talent and let's enable that talent to create the businesses, the solutions, the cures, the opportunities for the future. So fortunately, from your position, you can see the world, I guess, from a much higher perspective. You have a bird's eye view on all of the AI developments that are happening globally and the developments that are happening here in the UAE. When you cast your mind into the future, Your Excellency, what do you see as the most exciting trends in the development of AI technology into 2030 and beyond? So, um, I, I really dream of a world where artificial intelligence is going to cure all of these, um, not, not just cure, diagnose, cure, and prevent all of these diseases that are killing millions of people. Um, some of which have existed for a long period of time, you know, the cancers of the world, the other, you know, uh, unfortunately tuberculosis, for example, is another one. But then there is the emerging threats, like COVID, for example. You know, we... we uh, can use artificial intelligence at one point of time, hopefully in the future, to prevent future pandemics. Um, and I, I do genuinely believe that this is going to be um, a, a life that we're going to live in. There's another thing that excites me, which is how much productivity we can gain because of these systems. If you are able to have more time on your hand and you are able to use these systems to optimize yourself, where can we reach as a species? What we've, we've been able to achieve over the last 100 years is really science fiction. 100 years ago, or, or more, a little bit more than 100 years ago, we just learned how to fly. And then within 50 years of that, we reached into space and, and stepped on the moon. And today we are a, a species that does not believe that anything is impossible and everything is possible with ingenuity, with scientific cadre, and with you know, the, the resources that we have. But, um, you know, we will need the help of these systems that we develop to combat climate change. We will need them to combat, you know, a disease uh, eradication. We will need them to get more out of the resources that we have. So, uh, you know, the resources are not going to increase unless we go into space. Let's make sure that we can live sustainably. Let's make sure that we can leave the world better for, for the future generation. And AI uh, is the key to that. Uh, AI that is built responsibly is definitely AI that's going to create a better future for everyone. Mm. And you mentioned AI that's built responsibility. Do you still think that there is 
perhaps somewhat of a trust deficit or a knowledge gap when it comes to people's perceptions of the power of AI. This is something that you and I have spoken about in the past, in fact. I still get the sense that people are quite concerned about how this technology is going to be used and deployed into the future. So there are a few things that, that we need to think about. The first is, how are these technologies being used today? And unfortunately, if I'm going to be absolutely honest, everyone is using it with a brute force approach. If I can use maximum computing power to, to you know, increase the, the ability of simulating or training this algorithm, I will. But when we think about what is the cost on the environment, right? How much am I polluting the environment um, to, to achieve that kind of a result? That is an issue that, that needs to be you know, looked at seriously. Um, th there's a few things. The first is the trust in, in the capabilities of these systems. These systems are not all-knowing. They're not all-able. They have a lot of limitations that we know of, but we need to be more aware of. Uh, if you know what the abilities are, you know where to trust them and where not to trust them. Then there's the trust in people. Um, you know, uh, it's very important to, to look at who is developing these systems, how they're developing it. Are they you know, instilling biases in these systems? Are they you know, doing it in a way that um, um, uh, is unfortunately creating a worse world if we're polluting to, to train these algorithms, if we are not actually building these algorithms responsibly, if we're creating a black box scenario where no one knows what goes in, what comes out, and, mm -hmm. and these systems are responsible for taking decisions, it's not a good world, I think, that, that, that you know, we're going to live in. So, uh, in general, what I would say is there is trust. Today, you trust Google to answer your questions. You, you don't even question what the answer is. You know, you, you take it for face value. So, there is a lot of trust. But it's not the same on every single subsector of AI. And I think we need to be more aware. And just finally, Your Excellency, when you look at the contribution of the university, what do you see as the role of higher education institutions such as NYU Abu Dhabi over the coming decades in furthering the UAE's innovation strategy? Um, the UAE has some sectors that are considered uh, leading sectors. Uh, logistics is one of them, tourism, oil and gas, and others. These sectors um, are going to be shaped by the UAE moving forward. And I think the, the uh, bright-minded young people in uh, NYU Abu Dhabi uh, the incredible faculty in the university can definitely contribute to developing systems and developing solutions and even doing just research that will help us know how we can maintain that competitive edge, will help us know what we need to do to continue to advance the UAE's economy and the contribution of these sectors to the economy. And uh, we, we live in a very you know, let's say special kind of setting where most people have access that is unprecedented um, across the country. You can access, you know, whether it's government officials, private sector CEOs, because of the way that the country is built. You know, you can communicate with the leadership on, on social media. Things like that have a lot of value. And I think if you have the, the right idea, if you are driven, if you create the right solution, you will find yourself, you know, being uh, an inspiring individual to others, but at the same time being able to put that dream to work and actually make it come to a, become a reality. Mm. Your Excellency, unfortunately, we're out of time. We'll leave it there. But thank you for joining us on 10th Talks today. Thank you very much for having me.